So this evening we're here to listen from you and uh, your comments about the draft environmental impact statement that was prepared for the mandatory housing affordable program. Uh, the environmental impact report evaluates proposed uh, results to implement the MHA or mandatory housing affordability. Uh, before I go into that, I just want to sort of take a step back and talk about why we are doing MHA. It is no secret Seattle has experienced an unprecedented growth over the last few years. If you look at the base uh, Seattle Sun Times, uh, the city has, in the last few years, has added more population than King County suburbs all combined. This is uh, a significant rate of growth uh, in, in, in the city's history. Uh, this is a trend uh, that we see continuing for the foreseeable future. And not only because of Seattle's attractiveness, uh, its natural setting, the incredibly strong economy that it has, but this is a trend nationwide. This is a trend that started taking place at least in the last 20, 25 years. People are moving to center cities in you know, opposed to sprawl. We have now a demographic shift that is taking place both, both baby boomers and millennials significantly are choosing to live in center cities in opposed to sprawl. That is taking place around the country. And we don't see that changing at all the way through 2030, 2040, if you look at the demographics and that trend. So that's one phenomenon. And for the most part, I think what Seattle is experiencing has significant benefits. Of course, it has one of the lowest unemployment rates in the country. Uh, it has uh, significant growth in, in jobs, especially high-tech jobs, high-paying jobs. Um, the, the growth is also has a significant impact on, on the environment. So the city deliberately took a policy decision starting in the early 90s with its comprehensive plan that it is smart to grow in the center rather than uh, sprawl for economic, environmental, and other reasons. So there are those benefits that, 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 that the growth brings. But as we can see, and most of us experience, there are also significant challenges that we as a city here are experiencing, probably more so in the faster rates than most other cities, but this is taking place in many other cities as most of you see. And some of the challenges are obviously affordability is the biggest challenge, displacement is the biggest challenge, and uh, frankly for Seattle, in, in the, at the rate that it's been growing, right in front of us, the places that we know, people who grew up here, uh, and that is a significant jarring change that people are experiencing. So. Those are challenging times uh, to, uh, for us, for all of us, to not only recognize but address. But the specific issues that uh, necessitate the MHA in the city is we, uh, unlike most other cities, haven't had a requirement for private developments to actually contribute towards affordable housing. This is it's phenomenal, for, uh, phenomenal that, that we don't have that as a city compared to other cities that uh, actually require developments to pay their way or developments pay for affordable housing. MHA um, came out of the uh, housing affordability and livability agenda that actually identified over 60 strat strategies to address some of the significant challenges that I mentioned. MHA is one piece of that, uh, that strategy, the idea uh, to create about 6,000 units of housing out of the 20,000 that are projected through the HALA program over the next uh, 10 years. Um, just to give you an example, over the last uh, few years, actually, just since 2014, when we started this discussion about HALA, to uh, the beginning of uh, mid-November uh, of 2016, 
result of the significant um, progress and, and, um, and, and why, you know, in this challenging times, it's important to address affordability through MHA. So this evening, we want to hear from you, and because of some of the challenge, and challenges that we're facing, I know we all have different opinions, and there's no shortage of that here in Seattle. That's what makes this city, this city one of the greatest cities as well. People are passionate about the people, the place that they want to live in, and the place that they want it to be. So, and there are many opinions, different, different opinions, and we, as we've done for many meetings, we want to hear from everybody, and I hope you'll be, uh, 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 recognize other opinions and, and uh, proceed with civility so that we have enough uh, people participating so that we can hear uh, from all of you. So with that, I'm going to ask uh, Jeff Wetland of my staff to, 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 walk, you to walk you through, to walk you through, um, we'll have time uh, to, no, 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 to no, speak. No, no, Why don't you present the channel? Why is this first meeting? What is your call for three years? You're not Seattle channel, so people in Seattle cannot see this. It's a private business. I checked with you. It's a coma. Coma does not show everything. You post it not one second. Why are you not doing this? Why are you not doing this? Why? Thank you. So to that, I'll ask Jeff to walk you through what the draft environmental impact statement comments uh, entail so that we have effective uh, response uh, from you. Most of it is based on what is in the document and what to, to hear from you what we're missing and what, uh, what is not covered. Thank you. Yeah, that was uh, uh, Sam Asafa, the Director of our Office of Planning and Community Development. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, so I'm just going to say a couple of words about, uh, before we start the hearing, uh, about making an effective draft EIS comment. <clears throat> uh, my name, by the way, is Jeff Mightland, and I'm a Senior Planner here at the Office of Planning and Community Development. Um, so the purpose of the Environmental Impact Statement is to provide impartial discussion of environmental impacts uh, and identify reasonable alternatives and mitigation measures to avoid impacts. Um, so we're at the draft EIS stage of the process, uh, and the draft EIS um, provides an opportunity for you, uh, the public, and agencies to review the analysis and make a comment about how it can be improved for adequacy and completeness. Um, I want to emphasize that there's no final proposal at this time, uh, and the final proposal um, could include um, a mix of all the best ideas that have been studied so far. Um, a final EIS will be prepared later this fall, and it will include a preferred alternative, and that will be similar to what we send to the City Council for their review uh, as legislation. Um, the final EIS will also include a direct response to all of your substantive comments uh, that address the environmental analysis. Um, so, uh, what makes an effective substantive comment for you tonight? Um, it should address the draft EIS and focus on the environmental impact statement. Um, this is uh, not the, the ideal time to comment on things you care about that are outside of this proposal, um, or to kind of express your general um, opposition or support for MHA. It's, it's a time to comment on the environmental information. I also want to emphasize that um, your written comments carry just the same weight as a verbal comment you might make here tonight. Um, so consider making a, a written comment. Um, it would be in your own words. It could be as detailed as you want it to be. Um, and you'd have more than three more weeks to formulate that comment. Um, so I just want to also note that there's been extensive community engagement to date about HALA and MHA, over 18 months worth, hundreds of meetings. Um, and so all of that input that some of you may have been involved in today will be considered uh, in what's put forward as the preferred uh, alternative alongside this environmental information. The City Council makes the final decision, and uh, there will be additional chances for you to give input to the Council. They expect to take several months um, to review uh, your comments before making a vote uh, around the spring of next year. So tonight we're going to be allowing for two minutes of comment uh, for each of you, uh, everyone who signed up on the list. Uh, you'll see the clock start when you begin your comments. And uh, we'll be calling two folks up at a time. There are two microphones, one on each side, so when I call your name, um, just come on up to the microphone and you uh, can begin your comment. Uh, thank you. The first
first two commenters are Ira Appleman and Alex Zimmerman. Are you on this microphone? I want this too. You can have it. Right after me. Okay. Uh, I'm concerned about the parking issues, and I don't think parking is treated in the BIS in an impartial discussion of environmental impact. Um, for example, uh, the, uh, the city admits that parking is, uh, is very difficult in many neighborhoods. For example, it says on 3213, with the increase in development expected under alternatives 2 and 3, particularly in urban villages, which already tend to have high on-street parking utilization, Parking demand will be higher than the no-action alternative. Therefore, significant adverse parking impacts are expected under alternatives two and three. And the city admits in a different part that, that, that right now, some neighbors are over 100% parking required, so that you can't find parking there at all. Uh, then, in talking about mitigations, one of the mitigations that, 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 uh, that's indicated, parking maximums would be limit the number of parking spaces which can be built with new development. So a mitigation, according to the city, is to limit the number of parking spaces in new development. Not to increase the number, to limit it. How that is a mitigation is hard for me to understand. And then in the end, the city claims in terms of impacts, the city says the parking impacts are anticipated to be brought to a less than significant level by implementing a range of possible mitigation strategies. None of the strategies that the city talks about are going to bring parking into any reasonable uh, uh, situation. I'm also concerned that the piecemeal way the city is doing this, uh, East Lake is having trouble. I'm from uh, East Lake Fair Road, Ira Appleman, East Lake Fair Road. And there's a loss, there's going to be, according to the city, based on their corridor study, there's going to be a loss of a number of 300, another 300 parking spaces on East Lake Avenue East. And because of the piecemeal approach, the university district upzoning is going to have a big effect on East Lake. Uh, but those sorts of things between the, the U district as well as the uh, downtown and South Lake Union were excluded from this uh, EIS, EDIS, and they should have been included in so that we can see the parking uh, issues throughout Seattle. Thank you. Thank you, Ira. Uh, next is Alex Zimmerman and then Deb Chekwith. Hi. Hi, Mike. <coughs> my, uh, my people. <laughs> guys, uh, my name is Alex Zimmerman. I can do that for seat of that. It's not my first election. I look what has happened with Carla. Carla's very interesting three. Thank you, Alex. Uh, 
two that if you, you're not able to get through the, your complete comment, please submit that uh, via email or uh, in the online comment form. That's just as good as your verbal comment. So next is uh, Mary Ann. My, I am here. My name is Mary Ann Crossing. I'm here to give a face to those who are being displaced. Uh, I'd like to address two issues. One, affordability. Number two, traffic. Affordability. I have lived in one apartment for 27 years now, and I call it my home. In the building. In the building. Others that live there me, for 10 to 15 years. We are teachers, firefighters, store clerks, secretaries, musicians, among other professions. We all make far less than the published 80,000 minimum income for Seattle. What was once affordable rent has suddenly skyrocketed throughout the neighborhood and seems to have happened overnight. Now with the projection of more, um, more increases are on the way. I feel the large income of new buildings, all included, have impacted the area, even though they're not built. All people have the right, the earned right, to live in affordable housing. Since my housing is above a 30,000 income, I will not qualify for hollow low-income housing. So then, what will affordable housing look like for those far below the 80,000, but above the 30,000? And what will developers do after their 12 years? <laughs> Number two, traffic on North 45th and North 50th, directed towards east and west, is already seriously impacted throughout the day, especially during commuter hours. How will more hollow apartments impact an already complicated road system? Thank you.
was sort of saying, I think, um, well, I have not read all four hundred et cetera pages of this. I, from what I have looked at, it looks like this is a good start, and I really appreciate the depth that you've gone into. Um, a couple of questions I've had is, what is going to be the effect of, um, I, I don't know if this was um, explicitly addressed, but what's going to be the effect of on the different housing types that were, are likely to be built? Um, because I've noticed that um, most new development I see is uh, one, two bedroom apartments at most, and I think there really is a need for um, additional larger family-sized housing um, that might not be at a higher density than the current single family. Um, and what effects uh, either alternative will have on the different housing types. Um, and in general, though, I think that this does make clear that Either of the two alternatives, um, while they might not get to the level of housing we're going to need uh, 20, 30 years from now, um, are definitely, it, it makes it clear that they definitely do more to approach those goals than the no action alternatives. So, uh, thanks. Good to that. Thank you, Garrett. We can follow up and try to get this. Um, Barrett, followed by Janine Reese. Hi, my name is Barrett Colbert. I'm a resident of the Warren Street Junction Center about 1988, before the Lord Urban Village was going to be on Green, uh, Greenwich Village. So I just bought this house, uh, not as a speculator or anything else, so I have a whole other perspective. I'd like to first call out uh, Sam. I didn't fully catch your name, but I, I felt that was the first time I was actually spoken to as somebody at, 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 on a human level uh, trying to pass the full picture. Prior to this, I, I, as I, I felt that there been an error in indifference and disregard for my experience. And I want to thank Sam for spinning it and showing me that it's not just about how I feel about things. So it's a good reminder, but something long overdue, so I applaud Sam. Um, what brought me here was, uh, well, aside from having attended some of the other meetings, was an article early in June, City, you know, very on the B1 or something, City Studies Impact of Neighborhood Zoning Changes, some otherwise relaxing Saturday morning. Um, uh, changing, uh, giving many areas of more urban character, blah, 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 per the paper's words. But they wouldn't have a significant negative impact on elements of city life, such as another uh, print inch of good. I am sorry, but whose definition, well, I take that as quality of life. Whose definition of quality of life is that? It, especially just defining what I need to be quality of life. So I would like, I don't feel, so I would suck in on this. Um, this this part of the chapter with this questioning. So I would like to be asked what defines quality of life for me. Ironically enough, yes, I'm a house in so so off in California, so there is a difference of, of um, zoning between me and my immediate neighbor. They just sold family development for decades. I'm happy for them. It's how's their family? Within one week of the sale being finalized, the permit was posted on West Seattle Block. But a news in West Seattle: one unit is becoming a seven row house. That cannot be quality of life. I will never see daylight again in my home. So, on that note, what's the two percent um, uh, so, uh, developer fee in South of Union? Yeah. Is that going to be more? Yeah. I mean, please. Thank you. Can the boss not feel the deck? The deck is stacked.
Additionally, the uh, call plan EIS was not done for the same stated purpose, nor does it address some of the impacts and how you can bootstrap that an earlier and different EIS into this EIS without any discussion of the obvious specific differences defies logic and accepted EIS protocol. For police, fire, emergency, and schools, my initial review of the EIS flabbergasts me. The response is pretty much, don't worry, you have to figure out something. And that's pretty much what it says, they will code. Question, when did the EIS initially start? A review of some of the data in it shows very old and very outdated statements, such as Paramount Elementary School, which has opened three years ago, and several other schools that it makes it sound like are in the pipeline, but actually aren't. And for the final EIS, how long are you going to give us to review it? Are you going to delegate or designate within that EIS the differences between the draft EIS and the final EIS so we can figure out what to change? Yeah. We don't want to have to do a side-by-side -side comparison with two separate computer screens up in order to figure out what to change between two documents that are massive. I grew up in uh, the Roosevelt neighborhood. 
fact that this is the last oral comment period and we only have three more weeks to do um, written, when we need to be learning from each other, even just what to focus on in terms of discussing the EIS is shocking. It's wholly inadequate. Uh, the people who wrote it had a full-time job and could do it during the day. The people who are reading it are trying to do it at night. Uh, secondly,
alternatives. The city is only considering two action alternatives, both of which include the up zones with the proposed increase in height and floor areas. And none of the alternatives reflected the growth proposals of the neighborhood plans in any urban village. Uh, we requested that you use alternatives that use 15%, 20%, 25%, and 30% affordable housing. You rejected 25%, and you have not done any of the others. Uh, how, we should, suggested that you use policy solutions suggested in solutions to Seattle's housing emergency. Those were not those were not included, and there were over 50 recommendations in there that should be included that would help affordability tremendously. Um, uh, include all the projects that were currently in the pipeline, whether projected, planned, or permitted. I've examined the city's SDCI records and have found over 80,000 units that fit these stated categories and an additional 5,000 in single-family units. That's 90%. That's more than the alter, uh, alternative one and 90% of the alternatives two and three. Uh, determine the current situation for a baseline and the following issues. Affordability, transportation, environment, and public services. Without a full accounting of the current situation, it's difficult to look at the, um, the, the future. Uh, and include the impacts of institutional overlays, um, and then since the DIS has been issued, 90% uh, of the units built recently have been luxury units. Yeah. What's the impact on the cost of housing and economic racial equity of having all these luxury units built? The DEIS also does not assess the impacts outside urban villages, and that's difficult to do. <coughs> and a large uh, portion, portion of the affordable housing currently and in the future will be uh, NFD multifamily tax exemption, which expire for each project after 12 years. What's the economic impact on the housing prices and displacement once those expire? Comments 
said it lended its conflicts at the neighborhood planning level to no avail. My question is how will the EIS reconcile the fact that all two and all three are in conflict with the existing urban village neighborhood plan? And number three, the EIS assigns more of a judge to call and taller alternatives to affordable housing goals with no guarantee that our community will ever see any bad affordable housing. Residents of Morgan Junction have alternatives that don't fit into the one-size-fits-all urban village formula because we do want affordable housing in our community. Why aren't our alternatives incorporated into the DEIS? Lastly, on a personal note, I personally support all one for the Morgan Junction urban village. Thank you.
with uh, many laws of life since the light rail has come to uh, down MLK. And now we come to the up zone. There are many of us older citizens who have worked to make this a good community where we can live, raise our families, and our grandchildren can play outside in safety. And uh, we come to the up zone and there is a chance that our property will be taken away, will be displaced. So we think at this point of time, this is progress and we agree with progress. We are called a diverse neighborhood and this is good also. Of the three plans you have presented, one, two, and to have a great high risk of many displacements. So at this time, I would ask you to consider, consider, consider taking the Othello neighborhood to the least displacement alternative, which is alternative three. Thank you for your attention and listening to this matter. Thank you very much.
systemic and institutionalized racism. Also, as a multi-racial organization, we draw the connections between displacement, good jobs, and climate change resiliency. We are also deeply concerned about the lack of analysis of the impacts of the draft EIS on cultural displacement. Cultural institutions play a vital role for community in crisis, whether it's a climate event, community trauma, or an economic crisis. These institutions serve as the glue that help communities thrive in place. So without fully documenting the potential for cultural displacement, this analysis fails to fully account for the displacement impacts of, on the, of, the, of the proposed plan. Um, please look out for a letter from Puget Sound Sage um, and South for detailing our analysis and feedback on the DEIS. We hope you'll consider the critical racial equity pieces that are currently missing from the document. Thank you. Thank you. Like Manny said, we worked over the last year to help pass a, a, a mandatory housing program in Seattle um, as a tool to capture the value of increased um, property values and growth. Um, we're still working on our analysis of the DPIS alongside our community partners, but we already recognized several key gaps in the analysis, um, one of which Manny spoke to. We believe that limiting growth in areas of high displacement risk does not in and of itself mitigate displacement risk. Over the course of the last year, we've been repeatedly, uh, we've repeatedly provided requested feedback to OBCD on how to incorporate the anti-displacement framework into the MHA rezones, the CUI rezones, but the EIS doesn't reflect this feedback. We believe that a growth framework that says either we do grow places with high displacement risk or we don't is too limited. Communities of color and low-income communities deserve to be invested in as long as it's not at their own expense. We urge OPCD to expand Alternative 3 or create a new alternative that triggers other lovers. What would it look like to expand the rezone boundaries but limit height increases? What would it look like to increase the percentages marginally in neighborhoods with high displacement risk? Um, we'll be sending a letter and uh, Susan Ward. Hi, I'm Amanda Sawyer from the West Seattle Junction uh, Juno Association. Um, I also support the extended comment period for the draft and general <coughs> EIS. Um, I feel each section leads you down a rabbit hole of comp plans and regulations. I'm learning way more than I ever thought it would. Um, I also believe that having 20 plus urban villages evaluated in a single uh, draft EIS is not sufficient, a one-size-fits-all solution for each unique urban village with their unique issues and traffic, topography, you know, makeup, one-size-fits-all isn't the right approach. Um, I'd also like to point out that mitigation often doesn't seem achievable or even based in reality. Um, for example, design review on the land use section is noted as a tool for mitigation and design review process is being changed to exclude a lot of LR projects from design review or community input. So that is a mitigation tool for the community isn't relevant. Um, open space mitigation is uh, to ask developers to you know, impose impact fees, asking them to put public open spaces on their development projects and uh, these are the same developers that don't have enough money to provide more than two or seven or nine percent of affordable units so I don't think that that's really plausible they're gonna put a public open space in their projects um, and affordable uh, units in our urban villages touted throughout mitigation and there's no guarantee that affordable units will remain in the urban village and to me that isn't the community um, please do look at individual urban villages and their unique issues. Please come up with real mitigation solutions. After all, real people live in these urban villages, not hypothetical ones. Yeah. Thank you.
zoning one side of residential street to LR2. The population has increased 400%. There's no room for even 12 more vehicles to park, and traffic and parking problems on this narrow street would increase exponentially. But no data appear in the EIS for street parking in the North Gateway Village. Most of the residents on the upzone side of my street are renters, and all which should likely be displaced because of their affordable housing would disappear. Over half of these renters are people of color. One of MHA Hella's guiding principles is to provide transitions between vastly different sizes and uses of building. Currently, our street provides this transition. Both sides of the street are houses with yards. Directly behind us to the east are low-rise um, low and high-rise apartment buildings and condos, with commercial buildings east of them. Between these multiplex buildings and the single-family houses are backyards, a green belt of trees and green space. This transition would be destroyed by rezoning. Instead, 40-foot high, four-story boxes would like completely full lots, facing and alongside houses. The effect is neither gradual nor moderate. It would be abrupt and severe. The EIS says a possible mitigation method is to amend zoning regulations in urban villages to explicitly address transitions to surrounding areas, particularly single-family residential areas adjacent to urban village boundaries. <coughs> amend the EIS to reflect the severity of changes proposed to streets like mine half on the inside edge of an urban village and half outside. The eastern half of 103rd to 105th block of the north should not be rezoned for lots. Keep it single family housing or zone of residential small lot, just as how they did for a street on the northeast edge of North Gate. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, thank you for calling Kennedy. Coking. Good job. Uh, hi, my name is Jennifer Scarlett. I own a house in South Park. Um, I just wanted to say that I Thank you. 
part of the EIS. And I also want to talk to you about South Park and what has happened in South Park. We have not grown as other people have because of our environmental impacts there. We are surrounded by industrial toxicity and we have lost lots of homes. Therefore, we have lost population there. So we really shouldn't be planning for it. And the problem is that we are going to be losing our single family zoning with this proposal. And that, strangely enough, as you people should know, is what has protected us all these years. And we fought hard to keep our single family zoning there. And that is why we have yards and trees and mitigating uh, things to uh, keep the Duwamish Valley cleaner. This is a super fun <coughs> site. It's a critical area. It's a historical neighborhood. It was the first town on the river. So I really think you should relook at what you're doing to South Park. And we choose alternative one, which is not to do anything at all.
feel, however, alternative three can best address these concerns. This is because it is specifically looks at alternative three specifically takes into account a number of risk factors citywide, and the risk of displacement is one of the basis for lowering the zoning at a site. I live at the Othello Urban Village, and the risk for displacement has been determined to be very high. And this applies to me as well. I am very likely to be displaced. The largely immigrant community would be the hardest hit because homes at Othello are already valued far less than any other parts of the city. So they will have no, really will have no other place that they can go if they can afford to go. This includes also lower incomes, non-English speaking skills, less educational mean, making it anywhere, anywhere else an extreme hardship. I do agree with, again, our turner of three, that it does recommend, because of the risk for displacement, downsizing the expansion area. Uh, the MHA record suggests RLR1, and the alternative three reduces it to RSL. Uh, the expansion is, uh, was further east of uh, 46, but according to uh, alternative three, it is limited at 40, 46. Also on 44, the RSL goes one half block uh, west. I strongly encourage the city to select alternative three as a preferred alternative. I appreciate the city's efforts to reduce the risk for displacement when determining how zoning is to be applied. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, Deborah, followed by AJ Honore. There are a lot of assumptions going into the, um, the estimates for tree canopy loss that just seem very implausible to me. For instance, uh, for alternative two in the uh, TEIS, the study says that when single-family home housing is rezoned to low rise, that the tree canopy cover will only decrease by two percentage points. So it, it says that single-family homes tend to have 25% um, canopy cover, and low rise tends to have 23. So it's only this is this is not how it's going to be. Um, when I see low rents built uh, around the city, obviously, usually the buildings uh, use up most of the lot space. Of, you know, they use basically the, the space they're allowed to, and there really is not room for any large tree to be planted around these buildings. So, because of this, the tree canopy is going to uh, decrease a lot more than the environmental statement says that it will. Um, and so I think the estimates just are incorrect. I know they're based on um, the LIDAR, like the other gentleman said. They're based on LIDAR. LIDAR. Nice microphones. They're based on LIDAR where they're looking from above and sort of estimating uh, from like, satellite data or plane data. I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's just assuming way more uh, tree canopy for, for the larger buildings than is actually going to happen, which is a problem. Tim Trahomovich. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is AJ Honore from District 7 here in Seattle, Washington, USA. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. I'd like to reiterate a few points. One is we need more time to discuss this. It seems like this whole timeline is something of a foregone conclusion. And one thing that I'm sitting here listening to folks, I'm wondering, I'm hearing a lot of pissed off people, the more, the more I don't know, put words in your mouth, but uh, the more I learn personally about the so-called grand bargain, the more pissed off I get. <laughs> grand giveaway is, is what I hear when, I, when somebody says it's such an official or something works for the city. The grand bargain. Oh, no, no, no. The grand giveaway, if you please. Um, so I, there's, here's the question. Where are our officials? Somebody said that before. I mean, we've got some city employees here, but I don't see the mayor. I don't see anybody from districts one through nine here. Maybe they're hiding in the back. They're afraid of Alex, so he's not here anymore. Um, so, with regard to the environment, we've had some comments about the tree cover. Clearly, the 25 to 23% change, that's garbage. That's a lie. We all know that. Uh, development is inherently anti environment if you're looking at the environment as something that we 
like to you know, not pollute. For, some of us live on uh, super fun sites. For instance, there is a market rate development going up where I live in Belltown. It sits atop what would be classified in some states as a super fun site. There was a tiny sign that said that to the effect. It's like, don't eat the dirt. It's poisonous. So that extends all over the place, right? Anytime we're building a new building, how, many, how much in the way of fossil fuels are we burning? How much in the way of materials are we bringing in from out of state, out of country, and so on and so forth? This new development, on its face, is anti-environment. I don't have enough, enough time to say everything, but I'd like to reiterate those comments or re-emphasize those comments with regard to the lack of uh, cultural uh, environment. Where does the cultural environment go with these alternatives that you play before us? Thank you.
of Seattle. Um, I haven't read the entire DEIS. I would request that the uh, comment period be extended to concur with many people in this group. Um, one of the things that I wanted to speak informally about was that reading the alternative two and three um, impacts or analysis breakdowns, the thing that immediately struck me is that there seems to be an unintended consequence of pitting um, high displacement, low access opportunity uh, urban villages against low displacement, high access opportunity urban villages by the way the actual zoning maps are constructed. Um, alternative two um, wants to put more density in the high displacement, low access opportunities, and alternative three actually pushes it onto the low displacement, high access opportunities. So I'd like there to be a consideration for how are we setting up the social discourse between these urban villages that are in the CIS and how they are weighing up the alternatives for who's going to get the density and who isn't. As a resident of Westwood Highland Park, I can tell you we're on the south margin of the city, and the urban villages that live on the south margin and the north margin, you know, are, are being proposed in alternative two to take high density, but at the same time, we're not getting the infrastructure investment. We haven't had capital investments for 20 years in our area. Yeah. So how are we going to take that type of uh, high uh, density if when we don't have the uh, sidewalks? <laughs> and also the uh, other infrastructures that we need to be able to deal with that density. So I just wanted to put it out there, those unintended consequences that are arising with alternative two and three, that cannot be resolved. I say we go with alternative one. Thank you. Hi, my name is Susanna Lynn. I'm speaking on behalf of the Seattle Displacement Coalition. Um, we will be submitting more detailed written statements soon. But today we want to make it very clear how extraordinarily disappointed we are with the lack of quality and the lack of adequate or accurate information contained in the draft environmental impact study. It does not offer a true alternative, just MHA this way or MHA that way. There should be a true alternative to MHA that limits or manages growth. For example, a true alternative one idea could be you could downzone downtown so the base height is two stories. That if the developer wants to build 50 stories, they would have to participate in a voluntary zoning program and you would, could require affordable housing be built on site. Developers can't sue if it's voluntary. Base down downzone could be justified by our runway growth and the lack of infrastructure. If you insist on MHA, why not study a 25% affordable housing set aside? Other cities require 10 to 30 percent. In addition, this document downplays the amount of affordable housing that will be lost, especially the, uh, in the supply of unsubsidized, naturally occurring affordable housing. It looks at income according to household income, so that shared rentals, such as single-family homes, are all ignored in the count of lost affordable units, even though sharing a home could be the cheapest rent available. It fails to adequately measure the effects of upzones and displacement on our growing homeless uh, epidemic. The mitigation strategies are minimal. It should include one for replacement and establishing a fund to buy uh, at-risk affordable buildings. Alternative two and three pit neighborhood against neighborhood. It is not an objective, honest look at the impacts upzones will have on cultural displacement, the unique historical, social, and cultural character of our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, followed by Kim England. It's been said that you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And unfortunately, uh, and also, by the way, you're not entitled to your own process. This process has been warped and basically secret since it was begun when many of you were signed on to the Grand Bargain, which was done in secret without any notice or, or involvement. Um, you know, the deck is stacked, unfortunately. And um, what we heard earlier about, about, um, uh, about this was not uh, acknowledging that, that if, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a statistician who drowned in a lake that was three inches deep on the average. You know, <laughs> the failure is to uh, to um, differentiate the analysis by neighborhood 
by neighborhoods, and I happen to be from East Lake. East Lake is found to have the greatest amount of, uh, of uh, demolition, and uh, one of the five neighborhoods that would have the greatest amount of demolition and the building. And um, you know, unfortunately, you you have not taken our advice, and it's it's really what you should be doing is differentiating it. That's the whole idea of neighborhood planning. Neighborhood planning is is being basically trumped by this by this uh, 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 this MHA process, and I use that word advisedly. Yeah. You know, neighborhood planning is how it should be done. This this uh, 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 EIS is completely the opposite. And if you do look carefully at, uh, at what is happening in each neighborhood, then it's going to be a very different uh, result. And I'll just give you a couple of quick examples. I mean, you know, and HALA is referring to affordability, but it's not really affordability. It's affordability to people who are in, at the lowest level of income. The middle class is being devastated in our city, and especially in our neighborhood and a number of the others. And uh, there's nothing in this analysis that really acknowledges that and deals with it. And uh, you know, you have to uh, you have to go back and yeah, take another look at it. Um, and finally, um, in terms of livability, hala, the L in hala means livability. There's nothing to improve livability in this. And you know, if anything, the DIS documents this. So start over and make hala be truly uh, equivalent and in which affordability is concerned for all people and livability is concerned. Thank but you, uh, you're ignoring both. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah.
Ken Gould. I'm um, here to speak as a resident in uh, Wallingford. Um, with a lot of people, I, I'm afraid, would basically like to like, freeze Seattle after they buy in. And uh, I, I find that very disturbing because it, you, you can't really shut the door and not let other people uh, come here. And one thing that I, I think this uh, particular analysis needs to uh, look at not just policies in Seattle, but the greater regional context. Um, there, you know, cer certainly, when it comes to transportation, greenhouse gas emissions, and so forth, having denser development in Seattle will ultimately be a lot better than allowing more and more uh, expansion subdivisions to go up the, the foothills and cascades. Uh, and then when it comes to um, looking at the, uh, the uh, access to opportunity is a, one of the factors in determining what kind of zoning increases in different neighborhoods. I think you also need to look at what would be possible in the way of citywide investments to increase access to opportunity uh, for those areas that have been identified where it's, it's low. Um, without improving access to opportunity, I'm not so sure those areas would be as uh, good for uh, having <coughs> Thank you, Tim. Uh, that's the last name on the list here. Are there, is there anyone else who would like to comment verbally? Can we go again? Uh, <laughs> uh, seeing none, uh, uh, the transcript will be uh, in the final environmental impact statement, and all the comments you've made here tonight are carefully recorded, and each one will be responded to directly. That will be posted online. Uh, not, not until the document is the final document published. It will be actually a, a formal part of that document. Um, the other thing is, if anyone filled out a written comment tonight, make sure, make sure you uh, turn it in to city staff. Um, and I just want to remind you that uh, your comments via email or using your online comment form are uh, just as good as your verbal comment. On those written uh, comments, um, I was intending to break down like ones on different subjects and subsubjects into specific separate emails. Is that a good idea? So that they're identifiable as being on the subject, on that subject, or should I? Um, really, however you want to do it, I would recommend using the online comment form, which already breaks it down into the different elements in the environment. Do we get a record of that? Do I get a, a CC email? Because otherwise, if it doesn't show up in the EIS, I can't say I submitted it because I was just submitted it to a web form. Whereas if I send you an email and I CC myself, I've got a record of it, right? Um, yeah, we, I can tell you that we're uh, carefully keeping records of all the comments, so there would be a record of it. If you want to, uh, for that reason, submit it by email, that's uh, just fine. Okay, thank you. Jeff, who's making the call on an extension? Uh, well, uh, the super responsible official, who's our director, Sam Seifa, would make that call, and we've heard uh, numerous requests, and. Uh, at this time, expect to keep the, the deadline, but we are uh, listening to those requests as you consider. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was uh, Deb Barker. So thank you all for being here. Lots of really good comments, and uh, we, we look forward to addressing that. Yeah.